We are moving into the American Athletic Conference Part 2. We already discussed uh, Cincinnati through SMU, the top six uh, finishers last year. There are only 11 teams in the AAC currently. Uh, Today, we got Memphis, Navy, Tulane, South Florida, and Temple. And Chris, uh, let me get your initial impressions before we move into the first team, which will be the Memphis Tigers here. Of these five teams? Yeah. Uh, ooh, I don't I don't think it's going to be great. I tend to agree with you. Um, I feel like we, we have a clear bottom two. And then, yep. it, you know, yep. I, I wonder about the other three, right? I wonder about right. the other three. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know that any of these can contend for a conference title this year. You agree? I agree. I don't think either one of them are going to. Let's move into the Memphis Tigers. That is the first one on the board here. And the Tigers last year went 6-6. Six and six. Uh, The bowl game got canceled for them. Their post-game win expectancy showed 6.4 and 5.6, so they were right around where they were supposed to be. Uh, probably should have beaten Temple, probably should have lost to Mississippi State, but uh, regardless, you get there to 6-6 six and six, one way or the other. Returning production this year, number 58 in the country, that's 64%. Uh, you got a bunch returning on offense, partially because you bring back uh, Seth Hennigan, the quarterback, who was a freshman last year and who really was not supposed to start. But... Uh, you know, obviously, that's you, right. Grant Gunnell did not get to play. He was injured basically all year, and then he transferred out. He's now over at Arizona. Uh, the defense, however, only 57% returning. That's number 89 in the country. As far as their roster strength, number 63 overall in the country per CFB winning edge. Offense is only number 71. This is flip-flopped. Their defense roster strength is number 35 in the country. They have got some dudes on defense. Not super experienced, but but they actually hit on some recruiting battles. They got some big time transfers in. I'm I'm curious about this team. Um it, let's talk about the offense here. The new offensive coordinator is Tim Cramsey. He joins after four years as the OC at Marshall. Uh you know, again, quarterback Seth Hennigan is back. Uh he started basically all of twenty twenty one. He was number forty eight in the country in QBR, twenty five touchdowns, eight interceptions. You gotta figure out who steps up as the receiving threats after they lose Calvin Austin III and uh, the tight end, Dykes. Uh, The new running back, Jay Ducker, uh, new guy from Northern Illinois, that's good. He should pair well with sophomore Brandon Thomas. you got to hope that the offensive line improves a little bit. Their rushing success rate last year was number 83 in the country. Like That is just not going to get it done with Memphis. Like They have almost always been pretty good at running the football. They've had playmakers all over the place. I was just about to say. Yeah. That's it. They just don't have That's the players. That's one thing they've been able to do consistently through three different head coaches. They've been able to run the football. And could not and really get it done last now year. Now we're seeing a yeah, a, a trend where they just just couldn't do it at all. The defense, uh, you do have the safety Quindell Johnson. You've got defensive end Wardellis Duckworth. Um, the defensive front seven does lack proven players. Um, The new defense coordinator, Matt Barnes, spent three years at Ohio State. He was the special teams coordinator and the safeties coach. He's a young guy. I don't know what to expect from him. Um, But as I said, the roster strength is really good on the defense. Like, they've got talented players. There's just not a lot of experience. That's what I'm curious about. Uh, My keys to the season here, they started 3-0 last year, but, uh, but they lost six of the last eight down the stretch. They uh, they play like this is what scares me about this is Memphis has has been really good for what a decade now at this point, and yes. what last season turned into is what the beginning of a program downturn looks like, right? Yes. Like if they can if they can reel out of it and get back to you know eight and four you know even seven and five just look like a competitive football team then maybe they can avoid that. But this don't look like the same kind of offense that Memphis is used to. But maybe that's okay. Like, if you swap over and be a really good defensive team, then all right. But ah, I, well, Okay. Well, I guess we see this a little different. I like the hire from the Marshall guy. 
Like, oh, I, yeah. I liked what Marshall has done over the past. I think that's a big improvement of what they've had. So I think offensively they're going to be substantial. Hey, you can't be a lot worse than they were. I just think the offense is going to be a lot better if the defense is better. I think this team can be good. Oh, I think, not, not I think it can too. I, they can't win the conference, but like, like I, I think they can be seven and five. I have them six and six, but I really want to make them seven and five and still have the stones. But I, I think they can. I, I've got them at seven and five. So you've got them at six and six. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. So I, the way you were talking made it seem like. Like, there's just no way. I'm like, I, I don't know, man. I think this team's going to be good. I think they're going to be fine. Yeah, I think I think they'll be okay, but I will tell you this. Like, they're not the top it, tier of the top three. All yeah. right. Those three are separated from everybody else by a mile. Oh, 100%. But this is this is certainly the kind of team that could also uh, lose at some of these games that we expect them to win and then see, win some see, of the reason, that, Yeah. The only reason I got them 6-6 six and six is because this team right here could easily go into the Naval Academy and lay a big old egg because that's what they do every time they go to Annapolis. Oh, it's, I've got them losing to Navy. Like at my losses yeah. here, I've got uh, Mississippi yeah. State, Navy, uh, Tulane, and let's see, SMU. Oh, and Houston. Uh, but I've got them beating UCF. I've got them beating Tulsa. Uh, like I've got them winning uh, see, at East Carolina. I, I don't. I don't. I don't have them beating UCF. Like that's just not happening. It's, I've, I've got that because it's the week after a bye week. Uh, they tend to play UCF pretty tough anyway. I, you know, I, but again, anything could happen with this team. Uh, anything could happen. That's right. Anything could happen. My, I got my, them six and six. My keys could be seven and five. Oh yeah, they could be seven and five. They could, I mean, they could go five and seven if they do that. Yeah. Uh, you know, obviously that definitely not good. Uh, I've got on here. Uh, you got to hope that Hennigan can develop consistency, and you need the trenches to show up on both sides of the ball. Uh, because offensive line, and defensive line certainly need to improve after last year. They lost some big time dudes to transfer. Uh, out of there. They need playmakers to emerge on offense. Defense has talent and speed, but not much experience. Uh, it says toss on to it the fact that the new D.C. Barnes has never been a defense coordinator, and who really knows what to expect from this defense. I did put on here, if Silverfield has another down year, do not be surprised if Memphis pulls the, fl- uh, the plug on this experiment. You yep. you kind of agree with that? Yep. No, I don't kind of agree with it. Uh, I think if he's 5-7 and seven or worse, uh, he's gone. I think I think you're right. I think you're right. They are really positioning themselves uh, to join the Big 12, and if your football team is headed in a downward spiral, that ain't gonna work. So, yeah, you better you better get it done this year. This will make or break year for well, uh, for Ryan Silverfield. That will. I, I think he was a bad hire to begin with. So, I I think it's always a bad idea There's, when you hire a coach because the players want him. Yep, because those players are going to leave. Most of them are gone. Most of them are already gone. Yeah. All the ones that wanted him aren't there anymore. Congratulations. You got got what you wanted. You have got that right. Uh, We will move on. going to set the program back substantially. Exactly. Exactly. The Navy midshipmen. Now, last year was not good. And that comes off a not good 2020 season. But uh, but we will move on down to them. They went four and eight last year. Ken Niamatalola. Uh, la- I will tell you this: their post game win expectancy last year seven point oh five and four point nine five. So basically, they should have been a seven and five football team, and they went four and eight. Like they did yeah, get the big man. win over Army at the end of the year, so that was good. Uh, but that got them to to four wins. They had some pretty big losses. Uh, the linebacker, and I'm hoping I say this name right, Diego Fago. I hope that's right. Um, I got no idea. He he was the leader of that defense. Uh, defense was pretty good last year. Number 74 in PPA per drive. Um, let's talk about the offense. Offense was just bad all around. They were number 105 in PPA per drive. Uh, they seemed to perform better in spots when they had the quarterback, Ty Lavatai, in there. Uh, he took over in the fourth game, and in that fourth game, they beat UCF. Now, most of his supporting cast are gone. Harris, AC, all those guys. Maybe new starters can provide more upside, even without the experience, because they're they're number one hundred and three in returning production this year. Um, you can never look at their roster strength, and, yes. and it's the same with any of the academies, right? Uh, That's right. But compared to Army and Air Force, etc., Navy is number one thirty one on roster strength 
on offense and defense. Like, they are dead last in the entire country as far as talent goes. Now, again, you can't really look at it that way. Um, they do have some, you know, some big players coming back. Uh, Isaac Ruos, the fullback. Safety, John Marshall. Defensive end, Jacob Busick. Uh, and then, of course, the quarterback, I mentioned Lavate, uh, or Lavatai, excuse me. Um, I, I'm worried about the offense because I don't know. Like, it's not like people have really figured out the triple, right? You see Army and Air Force have success with it every year. But but Navy, for whatever reason, was really bad. Um, as far as the defense, they've been overperforming, <coughs> excuse me, um, under the new defense coordinator, Newberry, for like three years now. Like, they always do this. Uh, you know, I don't know if, if number 74 in defensive PPA per drive is going to cut it if your offense isn't scoring. Um, they really need the offense to to hold on to the ball and score points this year. Uh, because they, you know, they're number one twelve in returning production on defense. Uh, this team, you remember they went eleven and two in twenty nineteen. Like yeah, they, but that was just a long time ago, man. Well, they they have since gone seven and fifteen since that season. Yeah, um, I mean they that, were, that 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 feels like it was a, a whole lifetime ago. If you look at what uh, what their offense was, and again, they have not changed. They had Malcolm Perry at quarterback in twenty nineteen. Um, they have not had him, and they had not been able to find anything close to that. And they haven't really changed what they're doing, but they were number 18 in offensive SP+. Plus. That's uh, an efficiency rating from Bill Conley. They were number 18 in 2019. They were number 115 last year. In two years, that's how big of a difference it is between that quarterback and what they had last year. Uh, keys for the season, I've got let Lava tie loose. Uh, hope the new faces perform better than uh, all the experience that was actually lost. I said on defense, watch for the safety, John Marshall. Uh, he could be a stud in the secondary. Develop the linebackers. You've only got one senior. And the defensive line, you've got three juniors and two seniors. But you you don't have a ton of returning experience with those guys. So uh, while they've been around the program, they hadn't played a lot. So you need them to step up. Uh, I've got, there's no reason to assume that they'll remember how to score points here, and if the defense doesn't make a great stride, it could be a really long year. And Chris, I got them at 4-8. and eight. Like, I, I want them four to do better, but I I just don't, I can't find it. No, 4-8, four, four and 4-8, and, and that was, you know, maybe they can beat Army twice. <laughs> I've got them losing to Army. My four wins here, I've got Temple, Tulsa, Memphis, and Delaware. But I... I could see them beating anybody, and I could see them losing to anybody. Like, that's that's what's crazy about it. I can't see them beating anybody. That's crazy. They can't be <laughs> well, I mean, they were right there with Cincinnati last year. They were right there with Houston. Like, they they were in some ball games. Again, their postgame win expectancy last year had them as a 7-5 and five team. Uh, but they, they went 4-8. and eight. Like, they won three conference games last year. Like, this year, you know, you got Army and you got Air Force. Uh, you got Notre Dame. Like I don't think you're I don't think you're gonna win a lot of these non conference games. I mean, it's just rough. Just rough at SMU, uh, at Cincy, at UCF, at Air Force, at East Carolina. I mean, it it's tough. It's just a tough schedule. So I uh, I think four and eight is is just about right. You you tend to agree with that, right? Yep, that's what I got him at. Four and eight. You think they'll fire Neil Matalolo if, if he doesn't make a bowl game this year? I don't think so either. Get to coach at? I mean, that's a good point. I don't know. I mean, he went. He went. You know, he went ten to two one year. What are you going to do with that? Like, really? That's Nobody's a, done that in twenty years, thirty years. Like, that's true. And now you, you got to deal with you got you to live on that. You got to live on that the rest of your life. <laughs> I do wonder if it's a good idea for them to be in a conference at this point. Like army feasts on on playing Colgate and stuff like that. Like I do wonder. I don't know. I don't know. We'll we'll see. We'll move on to these last three here. The Tulane Green Wave, and of course we are all big fans of Willie Fritz here on this program. Uh, Tulane last year, uh, that was about as bad of a season as you could possibly get last year. Two sure. and ten. Uh, however, the post game win expectancy says that they should have been closer to. Uh, four and eight. They were four point three three seven point six seven. Um, their projected SP plus record this year is six and six. They were six and six against the spread last year, 
but they did go 2-10. and ten. Now, a big sign for them improving this year is they are number 21 in returning production. They bring back 75% of their production from last year. They are number 4 on offense, number 72 on defense. And when you look at their roster strength, they're actually more talented on the defensive side of the ball. Number 49 there, number 63 on offense, number 60 overall. Uh, they did lose nose tackle Jeffrey Johnson to transfer. They lost cornerback Jalen Monroe. They lost defensive end JoJo Dorcius. Uh, and they lose linebacker Kevin Henry. But they do keep Michael Pratt, the quarterback. They keep running back Tajay Spears. They keep wide receiver Shea Wyatt. Uh, center, Sincere Hainsworth, who looks like he could be an NFL guy. Uh, and then linebacker Dorian Williams. Let's talk about the offense here. They've got a new OC, Jim Zavoda. Uh, Zavoda, I hope I say that right. Uh, he is the former head coach of D2 Central Missouri. Uh, they do lose Chip Long. I do wonder if Chip Long just did not how he didn't know how to deal with so many young guys because they were really really young last year. Um, but he moves over to take over the offense at Georgia Tech. Uh, a big part of them returning, you know, number four uh, returning production on offense. Michael Pratt coming back. They get eight of their nine receivers back, and they get every running back back. Uh, that's going to help. It was a it was a youth movement last year, and you know a one year stopgap for an OC uh, that's not a great combination. Like I, I think they're more talented than what they showed last year. Uh, on top of that, you know I, I I think that this team the culture you could see was pretty good because you didn't have like some kind of mass exodus. Of transfers, like it, it was not. It, normally, if a team is used to winning and then they go two and ten, you'll see a bunch of guys transfer out. They didn't have that. Like I think Willie Fritz has a really good culture down there. Uh, you tend to agree with that? Yes, Willie Fritz is a outstanding coach, and I think we are going to see the greatest uh, mark of improvement from year one to year two or whatever last year to this year than we've seen in college football. In a long time. I would agree with you, except that Baylor went from two wins, like they went from two and seven in 2020 to 12 and two last year. <laughs> so, okay, but, I don't, the, hang on, but there was a couple of years between there. I'm talking that well, was. No, no, that was, that was from Baylor 2020 to Baylor 2021. But I do agree with your sentiment that, yes, uh, in the AAC, you don't normally see a jump. Uh, I think they are going to be pretty good. Uh, their two best players on defense last year were both freshmen. Uh, the defensive end, Hodges, had 15 tackles for loss, five sacks. The DB, Jaden Kennedy, who was basically a utility knife. Like he could play safety, he could play corner, like just whatever. Uh, there's more fresh faces coming in. At the linebacking core just stacked at the top with Dorian Williams and Nick Anderson. You need those two to be healthy because you don't have a ton of depth, or at least not experienced depth behind them. Um, Chris, they went 0-5 in in close games last year, in like one-possession games. Just like we talk about teams are going to regress back to the means when they go like 4-1 and one in one-score games, the same is going to be said for teams that went 0-5. Like, you're not going to go 0-5 in one-score games again. Like, I just don't believe that. Yep. Um, I mean, it, you look at this, like, Fitz is just a better coach than 2-10. This looks like a rebound year. I've got him at 7-5. and five. I could certainly see him doing better than that. Um now, obviously, last year showed they could be worse, but I, I think seven and five is a pretty good bench. Seven and five. Uh, I got them seven and five. I like it. You know, it's crazy. We don't talk about these before, uh, before we actually get on here to record. Like we don't match notes or anything, and yet we still come up with pretty close uh, records here. Like at Memphis, you were six and six. I was seven and five, but we both had Navy four and eight. We both got Tulane seven and five. I'm curious about these last two. Very, very curious. Real similar on these two. All right. South Florida. Let me write my time down. The South Florida Bulls. And boy, um, Jeff Scott just has not had it easy, has he? <laughs> since, since he left Clemson, he thought South Florida was going to be one of those kind of spots where he could come in and take over. Charlie Strong won 10 games there. Willie Taggart won 11 games there. But what Charlie Strong did to that roster really hurt it going forward. This team, PPA margin last year was number 117. 
Their net points per drive was number 119. Uh, they were number 127 in total plays per game, number 116 in turnover margin, number 125 in penalties per game. Like, they were bad all across the board. I, they're number nine in returning production, so maybe that's something to look at. Uh, aside from that, I mean, they went 2-10 and 10 last year. Post-game win expectancy said the same thing, 2.29 and 9.71. Uh, their projected SP Plus record is 4-8, and eight, but I, I couldn't get them there. Uh, when I look at this, like, Jerry Bohannon comes in. He was the starting quarterback at Baylor last year. I would imagine he comes in to take the starting job from Timmy McClain. Like, Timmy McClain was good in spots last year, but most of it was with his legs. I I think Bohannon's the steadier hand. I think there's less mistakes here. Like, it, this, it just makes a little more sense to me that he would be your starter. You do have a ton of returning experience on offense. Uh, they're number nine in that regard. On defense, the number 26, which is still pretty good. That 74% on offense was 84%. Uh, the roster strength, pretty good. Number 73 in the country. Like, it, that's okay. They do have a new D.C., Bob Shoup, who was the D.C. at Mississippi State under Joe Moorhead, had the number one defense in 2018. Uh, he was just an analyst at Miami last year, trying to pick and choose what his next spot would be. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not going to dive into a whole lot of this. They've, they've got 16 new transfers. 13 of them are P5 transfers. Um, it looks like a talent upgrade, but can they gel quickly? Like, it, this is a talented roster, but at the same time, it's been a talented roster. So you got you to gotta figure out what in the world can Jeff Scott do differently. And I don't know that there's an answer for this. Like, I could see him anywhere from 1-11 to like 4-8, and eight, but I don't know that it gets better than that. It's a pretty brutal schedule. And then when you look at three of the first four games, you got BYU, Howard, at Florida, and at Louisville. Like, I think they're going to start one and three, even if they showed up to be pretty good. So, I, I've got them at two and ten. What, do, what have you got this bunch? Two and ten. They're not good. They're going to struggle. It, it's not going to go well for them. Um, I, I don't know that they have the answer there right now. Um, and and, and I, I really couldn't figure out what, what to do to get them back to where they used to. The South Florida Bowls used to be awesome. They used to be fun. They used to be incredible to watch. Like, they were entertaining. They played good football. They could compete with, like, the bigger boys of the G5. They were one of the big boys of the G5 and, and, and could give scares to the P5 schools that would come play them. They're just so far from that right now. Nobody in the country is afraid of them. No. I mean, this is this is not a good football team. This is not a good football team. So, we... We both have them at two and ten, um, and I just I gotta wonder like how long do you give Jeff Scott there? It, but I don't know that it's necessarily his fault. I think the the college football landscape is changing, and if you were already in a rut, it is much more difficult to get yourself out of that rut. But hang on, now no, we disagree a little bit there. It's easier to pull yourself out now because of the transfer portal. You are in the back door of Florida, baby. You're in Tampa. You got a ton of money around there. There's no reason you should not be hanging with the Memphises of the world. There's just no reason for you to not be tit for tat with with the the other schools like that. You're bigger than them. You have more money than them, and you have more talent locally than they do. There's just there's just no excuse for it. You might be on to something there. You might be on to something because you could go in and transfer a bunch of kids. And you've got local money. Like, there's just no reason you can't be good fast. You yeah. Just, I'm just not hearing that, man. He's just not the guy. And as soon you know my opinion. As soon as you know you got the wrong guy, you, you flush it. Yeah, and that, that might be what they have to do. If they go 2-10 and 10 again, uh, that, that, might be, that might be the death knell. That might be what that is. Let's, uh, let's do this last one here. And we are on the Temple Owls. Now, Stan Drayton is the new head coach of Temple. He was the running backs coach at Texas last year. Uh, went 3-9 and nine last season under Rod Carey, and they just did not hit on the right hire at all when they brought him over from Northern Illinois. Uh, their postgame win expectancy, like they won three games last year, but their postgame win expectancy said 2.09 and 9.91. So really, it was a 2-10 and 10 team. Uh, they got that win over Memphis, but uh, that was... Yep. That was a little weird anyway. Uh, they did go 2-10 and 10 against the spread 
last year, so they didn't even outperform those expectations. Their projected SP Plus record is 4-8. and eight. Now, they're number 71 in returning production. Their roster strength, which has normally been a big thing for them, especially based in Philadelphia, uh, their roster strength is number 118 in the country right now. Like They have lost a lot of talent off that roster, and Rod Carey could not find those diamonds in the rough. He could not figure hang out. On, hang on, hang on. I don't understand. the ro- Is roster strength returning talent or just roster strength as the guys that are there where they rank in talent? The guys that are there right now, and it's a combination. It's co- college football winning edge basically combines experience and recruiting ratings, right? So you take your recruiting rankings, and then you add experience along with that. So if you've got a youth movement with a bunch of uh, two and three stars, your roster strength is not going to be very good. That's basically what their roster strength is right now. Number 118 uh, overall. It's number 119 on offense, number 111 on defense. So it's, it's not... It don't look good. I'll say that. Now, let's talk about the offense here. They do have a new OC. Obviously, this is a new coaching staff. Danny Langsford, he was the quarterback's coach at Colorado the last two years. Um, they did bring in a transfer quarterback, and that is Quincy Patterson II. Uh, Dewan Mathis, you remember the kid from Georgia that started, uh, I think, one game in 2020 for Georgia? Um, he was their starter last year and was not very good. Quincy Patterson the second comes in from North Dakota State, but he didn't play last year. So I don't know what that necessarily means. Uh, the wide receiver core is not great. Uh, even with several seniors, it, none of them have really played. Uh, the offensive line is uh, weak at best. I mean, it's just not this is not great. Uh, anything that they do this year should be an improvement over last year. You got to find an identity. You got to stop turning the ball over. They were number one eleven in turnover margin. Their offensive PPA per drive last year was number 121. Now, on defense, DJ Elliott uh, is the new defensive coordinator, and he was last seen as the defensive coordinator at Kansas under Les Miles. Now, the defensive cupboard isn't empty there. I mean, there's there's potential at every position, even if it's not experienced. Like, the secondary was decent enough last year, number 72 in passing success rate. Um but, man, they were number 109 in rushing success rate allowed, and that just ain't going to work in this conference. Uh, man, when I look at, like, after after Rule left, this was viewed as, like, a really good G5 job. Collins did good things. Then they missed on Manny, and then Rod Carey, like, really hurt the process. Uh, they just, they whiffed on that one. Uh, the roster is still depleted. Even if there's, like, stud players here and there, it's still going to take a big rebuilding job to fix this. And anything that they do this year, I think, is going to be better than number 126 in net points per drive. Like, I, they're going to need a lot of upsets this year. I don't see it. Uh, I think they're going to take most of this year to focus on recruiting. And and then we'll see from there. I've got them beating UMass. i got them beating Lafayette, and that's it. i got 2-10. 2-10. That's what I got, too. Um, I don't. I don't know how good they're going to be in the future either. So, I, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll see what this coaching staff does. But they just don't have a lot of talent. They're not very good. Now, you you were not wrong there. Um, it's just rough to look at. Like, Temple used to be so good. South Florida used to be so yep. good. And, yep. and, man, they are in a world of hurt right now. Just a world right. of hurt. I, oh, just frustrating. I don't know what happened. Yeah, it is what it is. Uh, you you get the wrong coach. Like it, we've seen it in the SEC. Like Tennessee went through years of bad coaching hires. Like in the G five, it. yeah. You, what, what kills you is you're right. But it's it's not just a bad coaching hire. It's when you compound bad coach after bad coach after bad coach, and now you're just a program that nobody respects. Nobody wants to go. Like it, the glory days are so far removed from kids that are. Day you're trying to recruit to come play football there. Yeah. I mean, it's it's crazy how quickly the cycle runs because, I mean, it was just 2018 that they were playing for, uh, you know, a conference title, I believe, in, in Temple. So I. Well, and, here, and here's, but, but, but think about it now. This year's recruiting class, this year's group of 2023 seniors coming in, okay? In 2018, they were barely in middle school. Yeah. That's what's crazy. That's. 
It moves so fast. Moves so fast. You make one wrong hire, and it can set you back a long time. Uh, and if you make if you make two, it, oh. I think you can come back from one. You make two, man, You if you don't hit gold on the third one, and that third one could be a good coach, but he's just shoveling himself out of such a big hole that it you know you might not get the results you want. But. Oh, but we're we're seeing that at Florida State right now, right? Uh, yep, that was at just the about end, to say. Like, Jimbo was not a good coach his last couple of years in Tallahassee. Like, it, uh, we we've got we've got different opinions on that. Oh, I I, I know. Like, I do agree with you on the way that things went uh, as far as that boosters is, that and whatnot. Is, that is a that is a burning down the bridge before I run off the bridge. But at the same time, it didn't hurt the program, right? And then you brought in another coach well, yeah. that didn't know how to pull it out. And that's right. And once you did that, now Mike Norvell who I think we agree is a pretty good coach, uh, he's having a difficult time pulling them back out of that. So, and Temple can end up with the same thing if they don't hit it with, with Stan Drayton. So we'll we'll see. We'll see what happens, but I don't I don't see it happening this year. So you got two and ten as well, right? I got two and ten as well. Thanks for listening to the Winning Cures Everything podcast. The website is winningcureseverything.com, and if you want to connect with us, we're on Twitter, at GaryWCE, at Chris B. Giannini, at Winning Cures, or you can email us, Gary at winningcureseverything.com or Chris at winningcureseverything.com. Subscribe everywhere you need to subscribe, and we'll see you soon.